Hello, everyone. Thank you for checking out this special episode of Really Dicey. This is Manny, and I am here with... Hi, my name is Alex Cal, and I'm the developer for A Life Well Lived by Cubicle 7. Yes, and that's what we're going to talk about today. A Life Well Lived for 5th Edition Dungeons & Dragons. This is such an interesting book. I really wanted to talk to you about it because there's not a lot of books like this nowadays. Usually, just adventure source books or setting mm-hmm. source books, or maybe a, a source book about like magic spells, things like that. But very rarely have I seen a book about role-playing or about, about developing characters. Yeah. And um, one of the things we did when we were making A Life Well Lived is we were thinking about what were the underdeveloped aspects of 5e. Because as you said, there's so many monster books, adventure books, dungeon books. But um, what could we bring to the table that was different and something that we think that people are missing? And I really enjoyed uh, getting to work on this project because that is exactly the type of game that I play is a is more of a role play narrative focused game um, because 5e is really great for for combat and for the nitty gritty measurement spells, uh, running, jumping, climbing. Um, but sometimes sometimes I just want to sit around the fire and, and and see, you know, what's everyone's ideas for their characters and how we can play them and bounce off each other because that makes the running, fighting, jumping, everything much more impactful. It's almost like a, a game master's guide for players. Uh, <laughs> what I mean by that gives players tools to for character building outside of action. Um, mm-hmm. So let me, let me ask this first. Um, how did this book get developed? How did this idea come about? So, yeah, there was one day where we were pitching all sorts of ideas of what we'd like for the future of our Vault 5e line. And um, we did have, you know, we wanted some magical crafting. We wanted some, um, a, a book of big bad villains. Um, and one of them that we had um, was an idea for uh, downtime activities. That's where it really started. Um, because we've done it in a few other books um, where we have um, things that you can do in between adventures. But it's never been the core focus of a book before, and especially not for uh, anything 5e on our side. So um, when we divvied it up, I did say I would like to take on this project um, because it seemed uh, right off my street. Um, and yeah, it, it developed from there. It was just the idea of what do you do between adventures? And so when I was making this book, initially, like all the, t- the chapter titles were named before an adventure, during an adventure, in between adventures and after adventures. And that's where it all trickled down from. Um, and so, yeah, we got, I think your explanation of a, of a Game Master's Guide for Players was perfect because uh, it was, it, for the character creation, it, it is that. I, I'm a real big fan of collaborative storytelling. And um, it, in, as a Game Master myself, sometimes I'm, I'm saying to my players, please give me something to work with. Um, I can't write it all by myself. So if everyone can come up with um, really intricate backstories and a lot of plot hooks that other players and the GM can latch onto, um, then we all create a shared world that we have such an investment in that uh, it's really exciting to see where your character is and what's the results of uh, your dungeon delving, your dragon slaying, um, and everything. So it, it, it was something that was really uh, like a passion project for me. kind of wish I had this book uh, 30 years ago <laughs> or so when I uh, first started. But just because um, it's it brings up a lot of really great ideas. And, and at the time, I think we were, I was playing maybe second edition D&D, AD&D. We were so into role-playing, although the, the books has some, um, some tools here and there. Uh, what this book offers is incredible. I, I, I don't want to skip too far ahead, but Campcraft is probably my favorite chapter. Really? Book. Yeah, that that's a handy Be- one for, for players. Yeah. Because um, uh, I, I I grew up in the city. I I, I was mm-hmm. raised in the city. So doing adventures in the forest, I realized at a certain point it I hit a a wall in 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 my imagination because I I never never camped before. I never <laughs> yeah. hiked before. So but the woodland like, critters were usually just city rats, were they? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and crazy dogs. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, but um, but let me not jump ahead yeah i'll um let's talk about life path first the first section mm-hmm. here um i really like this section it's a it's a, it's much more it's an expansion i felt of what available in the player's handbook when we look 
little bit more beyond like lineage and life path and and start exploring motivation. Um, mm-hmm. If I may ask, what what are your favorite aspects about this chapter? Yeah, this chapter is like one of the biggest ones in in the book, um, and it, it's it's I think the big the core draw of this. Um, I love that um, <laughs> there's a bunch of random tables you can roll on to to generate a character, but it's when I realize that the things are clicking together and they make start to make sense. Um, that is uh, the most impressive for me uh, when I'm when I'm playing it with friends. So there's a part um, where there is an adolescent experience. Um, so it's a table that you can roll on, and uh, one of the entries uh, says that um, you looked out for a friend who thought that their house was haunted, um, and you and you uh, stuck with them through the night or protected them from the ghosts. And when I was playing that with other people, we realized that actually that friend that I had was another character who or another player around the table. And that way we were able to realize, wait a second, that means we grew up in the same town and it connected uh, connected us for the rest of the story. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really interesting way of making sure that the party all have a stake in the story and connections to each other. And it's mechanical as well. Um, this isn't just a purely narrative or role play. So what we do is we say... Um, you know, don't don't use the regular character creation um, from uh, D and D. Um, start with this, and we'll guide you along, and you'll have the exact same stats uh, as you would uh, if you if you use the the player's guide. So, every choice and every outcome for character generation gives you um, a plus one in your constitution or a proficiency in survival, um, and uh, some little. Um, uh, uh, traits that like that would re- emulate the the background traits in the player's guide, um, so you can play this and join a party who've used the player's handbook to create their own party, and you'll be as strong as them. Because um, I know that there's that fear when people say, "I know exactly what I want to be, and because I'm a ranger, I want to have a high dexterity." Um, but I think the the really interesting thing about but this is that you can still h- reach that. But now you'll have a reason why you're good at clambering up trees. It's because maybe you were bullied as a child and you had to run away from them. And um, you got really good at sneaking uh, around um, the town, maybe because you had a crush who you were embarrassed to talk to. Um, So all of those bits add up to give you a fully fleshed out character um, in terms of stats and in terms of story. What What I like about this chapter also is that for game masters or dungeon masters, um, Mm -hmm. if, if I, wanted to create an npc as well you know or or, yep. or uh maybe a companion to the characters i could really flesh it out with a lot mm-hmm. of the charts and options that you have here um also um I, I i think i've made enough characters that sometimes i look at the character i'm like okay what's your backstory <laughs> and I'm, I'm trying <laughs> yeah. to i'm trying i'm trying to think of something different and i love that there's options here so i could just uh, create like you know go go as early as my my childhood of my character's childhood and, and different occupations they may have had. Um, mm-hmm. you, can just, you can just sort of roll randomly and put something together like, oh, wow, this is a, a, a fun idea. Sometimes I want to like um, uh, strain to try to create something unique. Yeah. And the, yeah, I've, I've created some characters that were really different in it that I would have thought of the typical adventurer. Um, so I might have someone who's um, a fresco painter who grew up... Um, with a with a sickly mother um and that doesn't sound like maybe a typical adventurer but at the close of the story there's um there's some ways that we get people into into the adventure so there's a call to adventure uh, section that you can find out what was it that took you from your normal life and made you an adventurer if you haven't figured that out already and um uh, for that it might be oh i i became a cleric because i realized that um um, the the church of this one god was really helping me and my family when I was younger. And um, after my mother passed away, I had no reason to stay in town. And I had this newfound um, power that I got from through my worship. And so I'm going to be a cleric and I'm going to go out into the world and make sure that nobody else is affected by this magical illness. Um, and there you go. You already have an adventure. There was one time I went in and I said, I want to be an undead cowboy. That's my cool idea that I want for, for D&D. But we were using a life well lived for everyone to make a character. And I said, oh, okay, 
well, now I know my end goal. Let me see how I get there. And so I could still play the character I wanted to play. But now I found out that he, um, and, and, and you can choose uh, some of the options instead of having to randomly roll them. So I knew I wanted to live in a frontier town. So I chose uh, frontiers. And But I rolled to see what my childhood um, my childhood experience was going to be in the frontier. And eventually I brought it through and I knew that coming to the end, the call to adventure, I was going to say, I'm going to leave that part because I know I walk into the desert and I get shot by my enemy who I'd figured out who it was during, during character creation. And I wake up and I'm suddenly this undead uh, cowboy. And it was cool because I had that awesome idea I wanted to do. And I use this book to now justify that idea. And, and before we go to the second chapter, I love your chart here about connections. Um, just because, <laughs> yeah. again, when you make enough characters and you have other players that make enough characters, sometimes you're trying to think like, okay, how do we all know each other? You know, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we try to construct something together. But with this, it's kind of speeds things along, you know, because yeah. sometimes um, discussing the origins of our characters could be a whole session in itself. Um, I've spent a whole session doing this, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but but this helps kind of speed things along. So that way, if we want to, you know, if we want to uh, attack something or, or do some sort of challenge, now we mm -hmm. we have a book that helps helps us kind of um, organize our 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 play in some way. Player. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. For this, I I actually um, I'm a big fan of um, Monster of the Week. Um, the Powered by the Apocalypse game by Evil Hat. And um, there was a part in that, just a small segment of, of when you're making your character is you figure out, here's a line um, and who does that apply to? You know, I'm on the same sports team as this character. And um, for that, I, I, I loved that idea. So initially what I did was I tried to pair it up with skills. Like if you are proficient in survival, then maybe you helped save this person when they were caught in a woodland trap. And it, it started to feel a bit... Um, a bit uh, con convoluted and so I just almost just took the essence of that and I themed some of those um, uh, connections around them and then came up with new ones and um, I think some of them are zany and lead you to kind of a funny meet cute maybe with some of your friends and some of them um, you roll it and you say um, oh we were both captured by the same bandits but we snuck away and immediately you're like oh okay so we decided to go together we defeated these bandits and now we've met with the rest of the party. And then the GM can say, oh, those bandits actually, uh, they didn't all uh, uh, fall to your blade. So there's a few who are looking for revenge and you'll never know when you're going to meet them again. <laughs> I love having things over players' heads sometimes. makes them like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A little added stress. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, chapter two, uh, Camp Craft. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned already that I, I really like this chapter because it, it gives me, um, even now, um, it still gives me ideas of, of what to do during uh, when the characters have, you know, rest up at a camp. Because usually mm -hmm. when we when that portion of the game happens, it's just like, all right, this is the part where everyone rests, gets their hit points back or most some yeah. of them back, and then they go on to the next day. And it yeah. never occur, it really, really occurred to me about like, hey, what does what does happen here exactly? Mm -hmm. And I think part of that is just due to my um my 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 experience with you know camping in general. Um, <laughs> Not but, very but exciting this, for you, no. <laughs> no s'mores well, roasting on the fire. It's just straight to bed. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I'm I'm a, a city boy through and through. Um, mm -hmm. But but I I like this because you have written so many great options. Uh, from crafting, cooking, um, things of that nature. Um, what, what, one of my favorites, your... actually, yeah, is is one of them that we that I came up with was um, mourn the dead. Um, it's a it's a point like yeah, we can all cook food or we can you know whittle some arrows for the next day. But sometimes at the end of a long rest, you've just been through a terrible fight, um, or maybe um, an ally or an NPC has fallen um, when you were attacked by a band of goblins. Um, and so but there are some that are really mechanical that allow you to get some extra benefits for the next day or to um, prepare a, a tool proficiency in case you're going to need it. And there's some that I really like that are just quite narrative. Um, so this one is it gives you the chance to um, to have a funeral right for um, a fallen ally and um, uh, see, you know, 
the check there is to is to make sure that maybe you adhere to that character's religion or you you know local burial customs that you could help um just to help someone and their allies and friends to to move on from that um but the the camp crafts yeah they're as you said it, sometimes you just say i go to sleep and i get my hit points and spell slots back um but when you think about it i mean elves they sleep only four hours in a trance um Maybe the Warforged don't sleep at all. They just have to be in a kind of idle state. Um, what do those characters do when everyone else is snoozing? Um, so, yeah, this gives you an option to think about um, either what you're doing before you go to bed or maybe as you wake up. Like, are you, are you, there's um, there's one uh, uh, like make a morning brew and that could be like an invigorating coffee that gives you an extra boost to your speed um, or a calming tea that might give you um, advantage on wisdom saving throws. And everyone just gets one of these a night. And um, it just allows you to add in a bit more flavor to those to those sections. And sometimes that will encourage people to say, okay, I'm going to cook this meal of beans. And then someone says, oh, I never knew you were a cook. And then some another character can be like, oh, well, well, here's the story. Or, yeah, I'm a terrible cook. And that's that's the joke that I'm I'm the chef. And everyone just, you know, begrudgingly eats the beans in the morning and forgets about him, goes on to adventure. I think my favorite section here, one of my favorite sections, I should say, is uh, Pray for a Sign, because I, <laughs> I've, come acro- I've come across scenarios where the cleric, well, there may be a, a problem or a challenge coming up, and the cleric wants to uh, pray to their deity for, for answers for something. And then mm-hmm. that's when, like, oh, okay, I got to put on my, my thinking cap to figure out, okay, how do I handle this scenario? So yeah. I, I love that there, there are, there's, there's a chart for it, um, and um, some uh, explanation about what roles you can do. Um, uh, that I find that extremely helpful. It's something that I will use um, in future campaigns. Yeah. I, I already know already. Uh, but I and like for that. GMs and there. players. Yeah, mm. that you can pass that book around and, and see. And it gives a GM a chance to maybe um, insert their own story into it. I know if you've ever played like a, a published adventure, but sometimes you want to have your own twists on it. Um, mm. There might not always be those opportunities to introduce those thoughts or um, characters. So yeah, pray for a sign. Maybe that was that's me as a GM, my opportunity to get them into the place that I want them to go, um, instead of them waking up and saying, "Okay, GM, what now?" So uh, chapter three, downtime. Now, mm-hmm. um, it, I feel like I, 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 this feels familiar to me. This chapter only because I feel like this echoes a bit, a little bit in previous Cubicle Seven books. Um, oh yeah. Um, you know, I think um, there's a small section about it in the old uh, Adventures of Middle Earth books, as well mm-hmm. as some things in Warhammer. Um, but this section is great because you're really expanding upon the idea of, of yeah. what to do. And and um and you know, again, I, I kind of wish I I'd seen this chapter years ago because I remember <laughs> once I had a we had a I was playing and um, one of my my friends was a wizard that wanted to find a specific staff. It was, mm-hmm. it was between adventures, so we were supposed to like get ready for the next chapter in the adventure. But we spent a whole session him looking for a specific staff, going to shop to shop so he could find the <laughs> right wood and shape and everything. And mm-hmm. th- that was fine, but cool. the, but I I was at a I was I was having a hard time because for my character I'm ready to go, and yeah. I, I I didn't have any other options of what to do during my character's downtime. So I was kind of. Mm-hmm kind of stuck waiting for the other characters to get, you know, having to finish their parts. Yeah. So, uh, so if I may ask, um, uh, what are your favorite aspects about this chapter? Yeah. And I, I do agree with you. It gives everyone a chance to do their cool things in between adventures, because this is for the end of an adventure or maybe, um, midway through when, when you have a week to spend in a town, um, and yeah, sometimes people have a really clear idea. And um, in a roleplay group, there's always people with different levels of experience or enthusiasm about the game. So if someone has a really cool idea of what they want to do, the others, I, yeah, you wouldn't want them to be floundering. So here are uh, like over 60 things that you can do in between adventures. Um, and that could be stuff uh, as mechanical as um, I'm going to learn a new uh, weapon proficiency. So I'm going to seek out a, a, a trainer who can teach me um, or I'm going to um, get better at crafting potions. So on the ro- when, I'm, when I'm on the road and I can use a campcraft activity to make potions, I'll be better at that. 
Um, but also for those people who maybe want to just um, to uh, narratively explore it, they can um, they can revisit their family. They can um, bring some some teachings to their children or some gold home to their spouse. Um, or they can uh, let loose and go out on the town and get get merry. Um, or if they've had a terrible adventure and they've seen some horrors, then we even give people the option um, to hit rock bottom and to really see how the adventure has taken a toll on them and what their friends can do to um, to understand and be with them and get and, and get them ready for uh, the next adventure. And you're right about um, some echoes from our past um, published. Uh, publications that we have had endeavors in um, our Warhammer games and um, in Adventures of Middle Earth as well and they have always just been a small chapter of a book or um, if it's a city guide it's more here's some endeavors that you can do that are uh, local to here um, but A Life Well Lived was our opportunity to make that the whole book and the, the point of it so I took a lot of inspiration I talked to a lot of uh, the different developers from the different lines and said um, what are the things that you found useful or what have you seen your players take that were really fun um, and what haven't we included yet as well? Um, especially in some of the Warhammer lines where things are a lot more nitty gritty or um, or uh, gruesome or action packed. Um, 5e is so versatile that you can do that, but a lot of people also play it um, for the story of their uh, brave adventuring party who are now coming home from the big bad Um and seeing maybe how, how the, their, their time on the road has changed them as well uh, and what they can do to better prepare themselves for the next time. And yeah, and again, you, you have a lot of great options here. Uh, you, could, you could grow a business. You can learn a language. Yeah. Um, assassination was, <laughs> was one of the yeah. things which I, which I thought was also. I, I know a lot of my uh, friends who are players are happy, are going to be happy with that option. Uh, mercenary <laughs> work. Um, you know, heist, performing a heist, you know, there's a lot of really fun things you can do from, from just uh, typical, um, building up your skill set to mm-hmm. having some sort of mini adventure there hopefully will, uh, add to the campaign that they're in. Currently. Exactly. Yeah. The GM can then say, can hear that. Oh, you want to perform an assassination. Okay. We're going to figure out who your target is, why they, why you want to do that. And someone could say, I want it to be that person who ambushed us on the road but I've no proof that, so I can't get them kicked out of the town. So let's let's perform uh, this uh, heist or assassination or something to get back at them. And if you fail, because these aren't guaranteed, you don't just do them. You you go through your extended tests to see, did you succeed? What At what level did you pass or fail? And that kind of different outcomes. And imagine you failed that. And now the whole town knows that you tried to kill someone in, in their, uh, their small peaceful hamlet. Then the GM can now take that and say, well, you're never welcome here again. And now you also have a bounty on your head. So every time you go into town, you're going to need a disguise or this character is going to now be chasing, chasing you for into the, to the next lands. Um, there's, yeah, there's some of those small, you know, quiet moments uh, or the ones where you're just building up skills. There's other ones that could change the course of your campaign. There's one that I love that is um, a dark bargain. And, uh, you know, we give a note and we say, this could have big effects. Talk with your GM, talk with your players, see how this works. But those are for the people who say, um, you know what? Those vampires had a point. I would like to be a vampire. Um, mm-hmm. And here's some rules to say, seeking out the right uh, practices to do this in the in the best, most powerful, healthy way. Um, and then um, to see what other people think of you. Do the townsfolk run in fear? Do your party say you've gone too far? Um, there's some, uh, yeah, just really interesting things in there that can change how the rest of your campaign will play. Mm. And of course, toward the end, you have a section about uh, building allies, contacts, and rivals, which is great for dungeon masters if they want to oh, yeah. flesh out some things better. And sometimes um, we can't help that we need these kind of tools. Because I, I know my my players, sometimes they like to do exploration if they're at a, a city during their downtime mm-hmm. or a town and they're looking for certain individuals, especially if they're trying to like build up either their spells or fix a, uh, an item of some sort, you know, mm-hmm. so it's, it, it's a great thing to have. Um, if you have this book in front of you, yeah, you can do all sorts of things throughout the campaign and you're not scrambling for, um, okay, this is um, John who runs the shop and, and Billy Bob mm-hmm. who um, can fix your, uh, your sword. It's, 
we might not give you all the names, but we say, here's a character, here's the kind of archetype that you have. Here's a suggested stat block for them. And if you're friendly with them, this is what they can do for you. And if you get on their bad side, this is what they'll do against you. So some, some certain silly things, like maybe the librarian will, um, will always feed you the wrong information if you have been, uh, if you've, if you've rivaled them up. Um, maybe the entertainer can always uh, give you the gossip from backstage or can pull someone up onto the stage that um, maybe you want to see how they act under pressure or you're trying to distract someone. Um, it's just, again, those extra GM tools um, that let you create uh, sudden characters who still have an impact. And for the players who say, I uh, I found someone to uh, teach me how to meditate and we grew really close. Who is this person? Oh, let me just check here. Oh, I, I think I'd like this type of character. And given that, again, collaborative storytelling between the GM and the players. Uh, chapter four, a place to call home. Um, great section. Again, it's something that has come up many times in my many mm -hmm. years of, of, of running games where that, um, um, all right, I have all this gold. What do I do with it? Oh, <laughs> you know, you, yeah. you know, build a house, build a castle. Um, and I, I, and again, um, architecture, things like that. Uh, I, I just know uh, apartment buildings. <laughs> um, <laughs> exactly. Everyone's know. dream is to own a home. So, um, <laughs> When so you, like, why not do it in, in role play? Yes. So uh, I, this is great because it gives me an, an idea of like what kind of buildings or, or uh, additional things to build mm -hmm. for the for players. Um, uh, what are your favorite aspects of, about this this chapter? Yeah, it's I it's when you're making a home in, in a fantasy setting. I think the first thing you think of is like maybe a cottage or a castle, and those are those are staple and, and interesting ideas, but. This chapter gives you all the things surrounding that as well. So you can make your cottage. Okay, how many rooms is it? How much money do you have to invest in getting a new room? Um, oh, do you, have a, do you want to have a stable to uh, to have your horses in? Do you want to have um, a, a bar that you can invite friends around to? Um, and oh, yeah, where did you get this? Did you inherit this from an ally? Did you uh, find a, a plot of land that you built this on? Or was this... Um, a villainous hideout that you have reclaimed for yourself. And from that, the GM is given uh, um, the tools because the players are asked a question, what did the locals think of you? If you moved into that big vampire's uh, castle, do they believe you're on their side or do they know that you've uh, you've, you've changed the course of, of history for the rest of their land? And um, yeah, it just gives you more food for thought for uh, bases. And um, there's one of my favorite parts that... Uh, just towards the end is okay you've chosen to settle down in an area so every time we have a, a period of downtime roll on this table to see what happens in your local area um because you're no longer nomadic um uh, a nomadic party in this world so if a plague sweeps through town it probably affects you too if someone knows where your address is maybe someone from your life path earlier in the book comes knocking and says i haven't seen you in a few years i need your help or maybe an enemy says, oh, you've settled down. Now I know exactly how to gather my troops and arrive at your house when you're not expecting it. Chapter five, uh, who pulls the strings? Um, again, just like uh, in um, downtime, I see echoes of this from previous um, um, uh, Cubicle 7 books. The idea of uh, like mm -hmm. a patron, you know, yeah. which is which are which are great um, rules to have because it, it helps guide the party yeah. to their next destination a lot of times um you have an adventure set up and the kind of cues you're trying to give your players of, of, of the options of where they can go don't seem to be mm -hmm. working well uh, yeah. and you don't want to and you don't want to railroad them either or else it, yeah it just it, it, it destroys the immersion by having a patron someone an npc someone to kind of guide them like okay this is where we should go a lot of times I, i'm surprised how, how many times had that even with the most um headstrong of of players having a patron there to kind of guide them is, is a great thing. Yeah. Someone, sometimes we all have off days um, where we just want, we want to just know exactly what we're doing next. I know I was a problem player for one of my GMs because I played a cowardly character who was interested in money. So when a burning village came and asked for our party's help, I said, why would I do that? I'm not going over there. But if I had my GM to say, well, this is one of your missions or, um, you can tell your patron that you saved all these people and maybe get a promotion. I think that character would have been kicked into action. Um, yeah, you're right about the 
taken taken um some aspects from other games uh, i mean um at the same time that this was being developed um uh, our warhammer 40k imperial malik dictum was released which was all about characters who work for a powerful patron in the city and so I took some ideas from that and some inspiration from that for the types of people you could work with. And again, this is random generation, if you want it to be, um, where you roll who your car- who your patron is, uh, what they want, how do they provide help, and how do they hinder. So it could be um, a monster hunting patron who wants to, to be the biggest game hunter, and so wants you to go out and find you the information, uh, find uh, leads, or, or take down something in their name. Um, and they might help you by providing you with um, uh, weapons to do that or uh, access to cities because maybe they're rich and powerful already. And if you just show their talisman, people will know, oh, you work for him. OK, come on in. And uh, some of the really funny ones that I had a great time making were how do they hinder? Um, because, I mean, we all work uh, for, for someone who will, who might pay our bills, but sometimes uh, it's not a not an easy uh feat to do but so for this one um you know they might be um they might be being blackmailed and so they're asking you to do really weird things and there the gm says who are they being blackmailed by what can i let the characters in on how can that turn into an adventure itself um or they might just be really ostentatious and want you to wear flamboyant outfits that always say i work for this person um, and we even have um, a really funny piece of art of the iconic characters from the cover um, wearing uncomfortable outfits that might be too big for them or too tight for them. Um, but the patron is delighted that they're wearing their colors. Um, so it gives an extra level of incentive for players um, and gives the GM something that they can do to, as you said, like, you know, steer the characters towards the next mission, towards a reason for the next goal. Um, but also it can create some more stories. Uh, are you grumbling about your patron or are you determined to impress them and, and work well for them in their name? Um, and it's another character that you can add in that has power over the story. Before we go on to the next chapter, I just want to sh- uh, share that I really like the section here. It's a small section, but I like that you talked about salary in this. Like, how, how much <laughs> it's, always important. it's always important. Be- because I-, I don't know if you ever come across this problem. At least I, I-, I did back in my early days of, of dungeon mastering. That's I sometimes wonder how much is too much, how much is too little, and would that upset the economy you sort of set up yeah. in the world? You know, I mean, I I think oh one of my first adventures I think uh, they they had like a, a king's treasure, you know, they had a, a room mm-hmm. full of gold, and then uh, the next game I was like oh man what did I do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Cause I've I they, it for yeah, because I, I gave them too much too fast. Um, so mm-hmm. I'm glad that that's something that a cup to kind of help. Um, dungeon masters and 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 again, I wish I saw something like this years ago. Uh, so that's what give me an idea of like like what can work without breaking the game. Well, that was one of the things to go back actually on the base building, uh, a place to call home. And um, that was one of my things that I was thinking about because I I recently encountered the same thing. We we cleared out a dungeon and there was a room full of gold, so much so that we couldn't carry it all home. So you know we we shoved it in a in a bag of holding and did what we could and. Um, and then, then we said, now what? I mean, we can't, you can't upgrade our weapons even more. We're like, what do we do with all this money? And so you can use this to now build yourself a mansion um, to have, to build uh, maybe magical defenses on, on a place that um, you know that the big bad will be coming for revenge. Um, and yeah, with the, with the patron, salary is one part of it. Um, and uh, there are like wealthy patrons who could even maybe give you more. But I liked with the how do they help. I feel like this happens to, like late game when you're playing um, uh, D&D. Is what other than money can you give me? Are you giving me access? Are you giving me magical items? Are you giving me uh, a new ability that I can I can have on my arsenal to to help me on my on my journeys? Um, but yeah, everyone got to earn that dough. Chapter six, hanging up your sword. Um, yeah, very interesting chapter. I, I very rarely has our games that I played ever get to this point. But sometimes mm. um, my adventures begin with retirement. Sometimes there's been stories uh-huh. where we put together where we begin here. And now I'm trying to think like, okay, how can I construct this to make this realistic as possible? Um, and, mm-hmm. and so my place could be immersed. So I really like all the great options you have here. Um, and it's, it's a, Especially for 5e, which is more narrative than I think any other 
D and D system, maybe maybe three point five. Um, but mm-hmm. it, it's a it's a great thing to have, and maybe to attain. Like you know, like now for for me now that when I play when I see these rules, it kind of gives me like a goal. Like where do I want to see my characters <laughs> end up in the end? Mm-hmm. It, yeah, well, like a life I lived will follow an adventure the whole way through if you want to use it. And so I always when I was when I was doing the the uh, retirement um, chapter, I was thinking about. What did you establish in the beginning that you want to maybe go back to, or who did you leave, or uh, what life do you want to resume? Um, and you're right, a, a lot of adventurers just play to the end, either that they all uh, meet a tragic fate, or maybe your uh, the GM and players will be an even more tragic fate of not having the time to play anymore. So having a nice way of um, tying up your story, I, I felt was really important. Um, and so it's it's reasons why you would retire. Um, uh, what is the the point of you, that you said enough is enough? I have to go home. Um, and then we give options for um, what happens to your character when we aren't following them anymore. So we give a, a suggestion that every period of downtime that you're using the downtime activities to between adventures, check back in on your retired characters. And here's a list of different things that could happen to them. Is it a is it a a really good year for them? Do they maybe meet someone new or have a baby or uh, get a new job? Or is it a, a tough year for them? How is their, um, their, bi- their business that they left to set up, has that failed? Um, did an enemy come um, to, to exact revenge on them when they knew that they were at their weakest? Um, but there's also a lovely one in there where um, uh, you meet with an old enemy who's also retired. And um, it's kind of that you know, uh, two old men sitting down and saying, listen, the past is the past. You were a super villain and, uh, and we stopped you. Move on. Um, and then there is the, as you said, like that you sometimes start, sometimes started a, a campaign like that, is the one last adventure. When people come knocking on your door and say, come on, one more for the road. Um, how, how do you go back to that life? Because surely things have changed. So you might have reasons for why you say it's just this one more time um, and what you're leaving behind and um, maybe how you've changed since then. Your sword arm's probably rusty, but maybe you've uh, learned a thing or two over the years. So you're better at giving advice to other people and um, you're better at, um, uh, at pumping the people up or um, you've got um, words of wisdom for the new characters. Um, what do you feel about the new people that are in the party? Are they your replacements or do you see yourself a lot in them or... Um, do you think that they're they're a bit too um, flighty and dangerous? And uh, it, yeah, because you you don't just you know become an adventurer, settle down, and then take it all back up again. And um, so, what has changed in you? I think that was really interesting mechanically to think about that. We didn't want to punish players by saying you lose all your spe- your strength and dexterity and constitution, um, because uh, that's not always the case. It's more like you're out of practice um, and might take you a bit more to, to catch up with people um, or uh, you've just you've learned some things or you you decide I'm not putting myself at risk anymore so maybe you get a new um, ability that uh, when you're on low HP then you remember this what you have to what what you're fighting for and who you want to go back to it was a really nice way to uh, end the adventurous um, story but also to tie up this book hmm and it's there's something also about um, I don't know if it's just our pop culture slash mythology is slowly changing because mm-hmm. I've been seeing more and more stories of people that have retired mm-hmm. characters that have retired coming back in the comic books uh, Marvel comics they did an old man Logan series where oh yeah Wolverine retired yeah. and then he came back um, but uh, but yeah again I I, I I love this chapter because there's just so many potential cool things you can do with it um, I've had mm-hmm. we've had um, event I. I've ran campaigns where we play characters that we stopped playing years ago and we brought them mm-hmm. back because of a new edition of a game or something oh, like that. That's cool. And, and then we're like, okay, uh, what, what would have happened between then? You know? And they're like, Oh, we mm-hmm. probably would have retired and used all the gold for this and that. Um, but sometimes it gets a little tricky because that's a lot of organization. And it's, it's again, a chapter like this a is blank great. page is very to, to, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I'm a writer when I, when I sit down and I have no structure, it's really hard to to create something from nothing. So yeah, if we just give these tools to players and we say, you know, here's some things to think about. Here's some tables to roll on if you need uh, some some more inspiration. Um, and here's some reasons or uh, effects from 
from being retired. And uh, yeah, it just gives it gives the gives the narrative tools back to the players as well. Um, because I didn't just retire my character to become an NPC, you know, I still have a connection with them. Um, but things are different now. So here's some tools just to make that different. So uh, before we wrap up our discussion about this book, there's something I, I want to kind of confirm in my mind about this book. Yes, okay. it is a fifth edition D and D book. And yes, mm-hmm. and especially in the beginning, there are, um, um, certain rules, certain things that you could give yourself certain, uh, 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 uh uh, either addition to modifiers for your skills and so mm-hmm. forth. Uh, like um, I believe in the life had as a almost like a astrology chart that if you're born under you may get like a prism, <laughs> charisma and so yeah. forth. But it I could a lot of this stuff I can see this being imported into different game systems. Um, I was thinking like Pathfinder, um, mm-hmm. um, even some OSR stuff. Um, yeah. um, do you do you think that's a in your opinion, an easy transition? I think so, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, as you said, like so, th- those things at the beginning of the book, um, what well, Sir You're Born Under gives you plus one to charisma, but it's not just that, because it tells you what traits you have. So you can do this purely narratively. I played this on the train the other day um, because I was bringing a, a book to a friend and we didn't write down anything. We were just trying to figure out a story between us. Um, I have suggested to friends who are, who are big Pathfinder players, and I said, just use this, take take your knowledge of the other rules, and maybe you can apply it to it. But here's a backstory generator, even if it's not to do with uh, stats. Here's things you can do on downtime, even if uh, I'm not exactly asking you to make you know a, a DC 10 um, dexterity stealth test to to steal a horse. Um, I'm saying use your rules to do that. But here's a book full of inspiration um ideas and the i mean random tables are always helpful for everything it's the same with um our uncharted journeys um book uh i mean most of that book is random tables of things that happen on the road um and you can use that and and crafty gms can apply their own rules to it um it, it the only thing i say is that this is kind of for a medieval fantasy setting like D is is normally in so um I suppose there won't be a life path generation for people who are going to um, the University of Technology learning to, uh, you know, harness the power of electricity. But for anything that uh, is is kind of in the same realm of um, medieval magical fantasy, um, this book, book is perfect. So um, uh, before we wrap up, uh, any last words about this book? Anything you wanted to share? Um, I just want to thank all of the artists who are working on this, especially um, because... Um, I mean, you flick through it and you've seen one of our one of the things that I was trying to to get across artists when um, when I had them on was like this is a cozy game. Um, I'm not looking for bloodshed. I'm not looking for fighting. I'm looking for the quiet moments that happen on adventures um, around the table. But but maybe the wider world doesn't see that. Um, I mean, Dungeons and Dragons. It's about using a sword and using a staff and slaying uh, monsters. But there's so much more to it, and I think we're really We've, we've seen that over the last couple of years um, with so many actual plays and, and so it coming into pop culture and um, that there's there's those quiet moments around the campfire. That's really what it's all about for me. That's how I got hooked into it with uh, and, how, and how my friends play it. Um, so to see, um, you know, images of a, th- a tiefling and her baby or um, or someone knocking on the door uh, to get their old companion out and their children being worried that their father's going to leave on another adventure um, or the druids returning to their grove, or someone um, camping underneath a giant tree. I mean, I, I really that really sells the book to anyone who's picking it up and looking through and saying, this is a really interesting take on what 5e has. You know, I'm glad you mentioned about the art. I almost forgot to ask you about it. Um, yeah. But um, the so like the cover for this, um, mm-hmm. I know, I know the. Well, you see digitally, it looks fantastic. But when you look at this up close and you see the gloss. <laughs> it's and, really and special, isn't it? Yeah, really like, wow, this is, <laughs> I, 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 I mean, Cubicle 7 has always done a great job with their design work. But wow, this is, this was mm-hmm. very well done. And I'll showcase some of the art in the book. Um, yeah, um, our graphic design um, team, yeah, they they were really enthusiastic about it as well. Um, because, um, you know, they, they are working a lot on, placing text and placing art. So for a lot of the books that we we do, um, they are seeing the same 
uh, battles and blood and uh, guns and smoke. So I think uh, they latched onto this a lot when they saw the really cutesy and relatable art. Um, and that those those inner cover spreads um, of the sunset of the tiefling walking away from home. Um, that that was uh, JG, um, one of our artists here, um, he did a, a really stellar job with that. Um, it just really sells that idea of a quiet adventure um, and the excitement of of learning about an adventurer's life as this person waves goodbye to their family. Well, Alex, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us about this incredible book. Um, uh, I, viewers and listeners, um, this uh, if you're if you're a player, this will be a great help to you whether you play D and D or not. If you're a writer, if you're having <laughs> some writer blocks issues, this is also a great book to help kind of. Uh, exercise or break through that wall, I should say. Um, but uh, yeah, this is a fantastic book. I, I I love resource books like this, just because again, it this comes up so often in my games, um, and I can't imagine this is that other dungeon masters and other game masters um, wouldn't benefit from this book as well. Um, yeah, there's only so many big bads you can fight, but with every one, you're going to need to stop and rest at night. Yeah, and, and five big bags are great, but sometimes it's just the little things in between that really yeah. makes the adventure special. And I love that there's a you know, we have more books like this that help um, give us more options and ideas. So, uh, viewers and listeners, thank you for checking us out. Thank you for watching. Be safe out there. We'll see you next time.